Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar from the National Pesticide Information Center. My name is Amy Hallman, and I'm the project coordinator here at NPIC. Before we get started today, I'd like to cover a couple of quick logistics. I'd like to invite you to please use the Q&A box to ask any questions during the webinar. And we understand that today's webinar is heavily attended, so while we'll try to answer as many questions as we can, for any questions that aren't answered during the webinar, please feel free to call our hotline to talk with one of our pesticide specialists. A recorded version of today's webinar will be available soon on the NPIC website and on our YouTube channel. For our presentation today, I'd like to introduce our speakers, beginning with Alicia Leadham. Alicia is a senior pesticide specialist here at NPIC. She has a master's in soil science and a bachelor's in botany, both from here at OSU. Some of her past experience includes working for an organic farm and outdoor science education for kids. She is also an avid gardener, mushroom hunter, and food preserver in her spare time. Our first speaker is April Strid. A native Oregonian, April has a background in geology and soil science and has been a pesticide specialist for just over a year at NPIC. Before working with NPIC, she spent her time studying Oregon forest soils and organizing research projects about soil nutrition and carbon cycling. Welcome, April. Thank you very much, Amy. I appreciate the introduction. Now, let's go ahead and get started today. Good morning and um, good afternoon for those of you on a, uh, in a different part of the country. So I'm going to get started by talking about some of NPIC's services, what we do here at the National Pesticide Information Center, and how that relates to the, some of the questions that you might receive as a master gardener. A lot of the questions that we receive overlap with the types of questions that you might encounter as well. Things like, what happens if weed killer in my, is in my grass clippings? Can I use that in my compost pile? Or can I use a pesticide in the yard to control ticks? Is that going to affect my garden? Could slug bait hurt my dog? These are the types of questions that we receive, but um, we also are hoping to talk about the tools today that we might be able to um, give you so that you are better prepared to answer some of these questions as well. So while we're not going to be talking about those specific answers to those questions, we're talking about some of those tools we use. And so one of that, those things is risk risk communication, so we will be talking about risk communication after NPIC uh, services. We'll talk about organic pesticides and what that means. And Alicia will take over to discuss pollinators and pollinators and pesticides. And we'll finish up with some safe use practices and um, then we'll have some time for questions. So let's go ahead and get started. At the National Pesticide Information Center, we are first and foremost an information library for pesticides. Our goal is to provide unbiased, science-based information about all things pesticides. So one of the things that we do is we run an information line from 8 a.m. to noon Pacific time, Monday through Friday. And one of those, some of those questions that we have are easy to answer when when we can have a conversation about something. So sometimes that hotline is a really great resource. We can also answer questions via email, and we have a lot of content on our website as well. There's um, hundreds of informational pages. There's also some information available in Spanish. And those informational pages are written in a way that they're based on the questions that we receive. So hopefully a lot of that information on the website can be helpful to you as well. We are at Oregon State University in Oregon. We're grant funded through, B, through the EPA, but we're not a regulatory body. We're not the same as the EPA. Now, our team is made up of trained specialists. Myself and Alicia are both trained specialists. We have a large range of backgrounds. We both have backgrounds in soil science. Um, we have people here with backgrounds in toxicology, microbiology, journalism, chemistry. We come from a, a large range of expertise. So we're here to translate science into information that people can understand. We talk to all sorts of people. Generally, um, the audience is, are members of the general public. I've spoken to veterinarians, doctors, homeowners. I've even spoken to somebody who was running for office before. So to finish this up, we provide unbiased science-based information so that we can help people to make informed decisions. A lot of what we cover are 
questions relating to health and safety concerns relating to pesticides. We cover um, topics related to pregnancy, animals, environment, soil, water, air. One of the other interesting things that we do is we collect incident information when someone um, reports that they have had some type of exposure to a pesticide. So say, for example, someone calls in and they're telling me that they spilled a pesticide on their arm and they have some type of rash. What I'm going to do is I'm going to collect some information about how that occurred, what pesticide was, was involved, um, and all of this type of information is anonymous. It's not attached to that particular person. But that general body of data can be submitted and given to the EPA, and it can help inform regulatory decisions about certain pesticides. We also have a lot of information about pest control. Um, if there's a particular pest you're wondering about, ants, um, carpenter ants, termites, all types of pests you might have, either indoor or outdoor. We discuss integrated pest management methods as well. We discuss regulations. And we also have a lot of information on both indoor and outdoor pesticide use. So while we probably will focus on more examples of outdoor because we're discuss discussing topics that are more related to master gardeners today, we also have a lot of information about indoor pesticide use. Um, a couple of things we don't do, we don't make pesticide recommendations, and we also do not have medical training, and so we are not providing medical advice, we're not providing medical treatment advice just because we aren't, aren't medically trained. Now, for um, some of our most popular web pages are our active ingredients fact sheets. For questions that are about a certain active ingredient, consider going online and looking for these general fact sheets that can be found on our website. These are peer-reviewed documents, and we aim for them to be easy to understand with easily digestible information, and they're broken into a question and answer format with questions like, how does this pesticide work? Or, other links to cancer. What are the symptoms that could come up if I were to be exposed or if my pets were be, to be exposed to something like this? So these active ingredient fact sheets could be really helpful for, for a lot of questions that do come up. While we don't have pesticide fact sheets about every pesticide that's out there, we have written fact sheets about um, ingredients that we get the most questions about. All right, another um, resource that we have are videos. We have a um, few minute videos about frequently asked questions, a few also about specific active ingredients. These videos are available on our website, also available on YouTube. I encourage you to check those out. Now, there are also some questions we sometimes get that were not the correct resource uh, to, to address those to. So we keep a list of local resources that are Easily, easily found using um, a map like this. So if you come across this map on our website, this is where you might find contact information for master gardeners. You also uh, might find contact information for the extension service, um, state and federal agencies such as the Department of Agriculture, health departments, and also divisions within the EPA. Now with that, I'd like to transition away from our services at the National Pesticide Information Center into talking a little bit more about risk and the factors that we can discuss that um, help, help people understand pesticide risk. So some of those questions I mentioned earlier, like are grass clippings with a weed killer okay to use in my compost pile? Or can I use treated wood in my garden bed? Or something like, can I plant vegetables after using an herbicide? These are questions that can be simplified down into this simple question of, is it safe? There's usually not just a yes or no answer to that question, is it safe? Instead, there's a lot of different factors that might play a role. So if someone um, calls in and asks me, I'm gonna ask me some of these questions, I don't wanna say, yes, it's safe, or no, it's not safe, because this binary thinking doesn't provide the full picture. If the answer to the question, is it safe, yes, if the answer is just yes, that can imply that there are no precautions necessary. On the other hand, if the answer is no, it's not safe, then we can create needless anxiety, some type of alarm or unease, and no 
pesticide is completely 100% safe. Um, because pesticides are intended to kill or harm some type of pest, there can be some risk involved, and that's why we frame it using risk. <clears throat> so to use a, an example with driving a car, say we, we can't say that driving a car is 100% safe, and that's because there may be some unknowns involved. Um, we don't want to say that no precautions are necessary. It's better to understand the fuller picture, understand the risks involved, and understand what can be done in a, a single situation so that we're empowered to figure out what we can do, what we are in control of to reduce the risk. So at NPIC, when I get a call um, and someone is asking, can I use treated wood in my garden bed? What I'm thinking in my head is this person is curious about what the risks might be of using treated wood in the garden bed. So we can have a conversation about that and discuss where their concerns lie and we can talk where the risk comes from in their situation. Now, there's sort of a simple formula for understanding where the risk comes from in any particular situation. Um, with pesticides, we want to talk about both the toxicity of that, of that pesticide and the potential for exposure. So this means how much you might be exposed to it, where you might be exposed to it. And something getting something in your eye might be really different than getting it on your skin. So to demonstrate this, I want to use a couple really simple examples to show how toxicity and exposure are really the keys here. So think about drinking water. On the right is a bar showing um, the level of toxicity of these, fact of, the, of these items, and on the left is the level of exposure. So drinking water, of course, is very low in toxicity. With enough exposure to even something like drinking water that's very low in toxicity, if someone were to drink water continually, keep, keep drinking, with enough exposure, you can get very sick. It can be fatal. So even with something that's low in toxicity, it's important to, to understand that that exposure is an important factor. In a slightly different example with radioactive waste, of course, it's higher in toxicity. And so with that high level of toxicity, a small exposure oops, might result in a really high level of risk. So with any situation, of course it's more complicated than drinking water or radioactive waste. So there's a lot of factors to think about. Um, again, to think about the driving example. Factors like the type of car you have, the safety features in that car, the frequency of, drive, of, of your driving and the road conditions, um, the precautionary measures that you might be taking, how distracted you may be, um, whether you're wearing seat belts or have, have the appropriate car seats. These are all factors that can affect the risks with driving. And again, there's some unknowns here. So we can't predict what the person across the road from us is going to do. There might be some unknowns in the particular road conditions. So the unknowns are also an important thing to recognize when we're discussing risk. With pesticides, some of these similar factors will play in. So the type of pesticide is important. That toxicity factor um, will, will, will come up in the type of pesticide when you start looking into that. The frequency of pesticide use is something's used more often. That risk can change. The conditions that you're doing an application, um, that these can also affect the potential for drift and exposure to off-site places um, or off-target organisms. And precautionary measures. The, wearing the appropriate clothing can reduce risk as well. So when it comes to a question like this, um, there's, again, these two factors we want to focus on, toxicity and exposure. If you're coming across questions about pesticides, try and frame them with these two things, the toxicity and the exposure. See if um, bringing these into the conversation can help, understand, help us understand where, where that risk really lies. So with fish, we, we, we could assess whether something is toxic to fish, and then we can assess where are those fish in relation, in relation to where this is being applied? 
can that pesticide move through soil? Is that pesticide soluble in water? Now, keeping that in mind, there's also factors in our perception that can change how risk is perceived. So, <clears throat> not understanding how our brain might misperceive something can skew us in the wrong way. Um, sometimes risk is drastically overestimated. It can also be underestimated. To demonstrate this, think about a time you felt like you were very afraid of something you shouldn't be. Maybe it felt really irrational. Maybe you have been surprised by someone who's doing something that you thought was way too risky to even consider. Sometimes we overreact. Sometimes we underreact. And this is really fascinating. There's lots of different things we know to be factors that might affect how we perceive something, something that could be risky. And this doesn't just apply to pesticides. This applies to, to a lot of things that we might encounter. On the left are factors that can reduce how risky we might see something to be. And on the right are things that might make us think something is particularly risky. So if something's voluntary or more, we see it as more beneficial, that can make something seem less risky. If, for example, a landlord is saying, you have to treat your apartment for cockroaches, this might be seen as something that's imposed upon you, and so it's seen as lower risk. Maybe you don't worry about, uh, about cockroaches, and so you don't think it's beneficial to, to, to get rid of them. Seeing it as not beneficial can also make that risk seem a little bit higher. So keep these types of factors in, in mind when you come across things that you think may be unsafe or too risky. And these can help inform those conversations. So I wanted to talk about risk communication today to introduce, introduce this idea of not just using yes or no answers for those, those questions about safety, but instead framing them using risk. You are in situations just like we are answering some question, questions from the public, and it can be helpful to ask more questions about that situation. Help them understand what they're most concerned about. And it, what's really key is figuring out what that person is comfortable with, what level of risk they are comfortable with, because for every individual, that's going to be really different. Alicia will be talking a little bit more later about what, the type, what types of things we can do to minimize risk. But before um, Alicia jumps in, I'm going to talk about organic pesticides. Um, so we'll transition here into organics. The, when we hear the term organic pesticides, what you should be thinking are pesticides that are approved for use in organic production. These are still pesticides. One of the common misconceptions about organic food is that it has been grown without pesticides, but it's not the case. Organic foods aren't necessarily pesticide free, but they've been grown and produced with pesticides that have been approved for use with the EPA and then also by the USDA's organic standards. The ingredients in organic pesticides are typically ingredients that are found in nature. They're non man-made or non-synthetic materials, there are exceptions to that rule. So um, things that are found in nature that can't be used in organic production include things like arsenic or lead salts. Tobacco dust is another example. Examples of ingredients that can be used in organic production include diatomaceous earth, which are ground up marine organisms, pepper, soaps, acetic acid, pyrethrins, neem oil, this is an image of a neem seed. Maybe you've come across some of these um, just in your ev everyday work as well. Now, if you were to be looking for a or pesticide that could be used for organic, organic production, this is a logo we're really familiar with, but this is not the logo that would be on an organic input. Inputs are going to have a different logo. This is for food and not for pesticides. So just like an organic farm could be going through certification to display that circular logo, any crop input that's used for organic production, fertilizers or pesticides, can go through a certification to be used 
in production. Now, the Organic Materials Review Institute is one of the main certifying bodies. It's a nonprofit. It's not an organ. It's not a government organization, and they keep a list of organic products that they certify. They have about 6,000 products that are currently registered. Maybe you've seen this logo on products that you've used before. Other products that you might come across include this logo on the left from the Washington State Department of Agriculture. You might also come across this logo um, down on the bottom that says for organic production or for organic gardening. These are from the EPA. Now the materials used in organic pesticides are very specific. There's only certain active ingredients and inert ingredients that can be used. And those inputs are also used or produced using certain standards, and they're used in really specific ways. So ozone gas, for example, is approved for use, but it's only used to clean irrigation systems. Boric acid is approved for use, but only for pest control in structures. There shouldn't be any food contact. And some uses are really specific, like ethylene gas is for just for use for regulating pineapple flowering. So are organic pesticides safer? This is a question that maybe you've thought about, maybe you've come across before too. Even though these products may have ingredients that are um, maybe found, excuse me, maybe these, ing these ingredients are found in nature, they are likely to have some level of toxicity. And because they have some level of toxicity, they have some level of risk involved. Um, all pesticides, organic or not, are intended to kill or harm some type of pest. So the answer to this question, again, may come down to the situation-specific risk question like was discussed earlier. So we could talk about the toxicity of that particular product and exposure. So vinegar, like a 20% vinegar solution, for example, is approved for use in organic production but can cause, um, can cause serious eye damage. In another example, neem oil is something that's approved for use in organic production, but one of the components in neem oil, as azadiractin, can cause some stomach and skin irritation. So it's important to understand where the risks might, coming, might be coming from in any particular situation. Remembering that toxicity and exposure are both important factors and having those conversations that are about risk and, and asking questions and understanding um, where a given person's comfortable level of risk may lie. That's all I've got for you today and I'm going to hand it over to Alicia right now so she can take over and um, continue with the discussion. Hey guys, this is Alicia. Um, sorry about all the technical problems at the beginning of the webinar. I'm hoping that things are uh, working better for all of you out there now. So I'm going to transition a little bit and start talking about pollinators and pollinator protection, um, ways to think about those pollinators when you're using products in your yard or garden. Um, primarily, I'm going to be addressing yard and garden use because we're talking to master gardeners, but a lot of these tips can also be used um, for reducing risks in other situations, not necessarily for pollinators. Okay, so as master gardeners, you guys are more than trained on, you know, the benefits of pollinators, the importance of pollinators. Most people think about honeybees when they hear pollinators, um, and pollinators have been in the news a lot more lately because of, you know, colony collapse disorder and other situations where pollinators are being poisoned or they're getting diseases or they're dealing with varroa mites. Um, as master gardeners, you're aware that honeybees are not the only pollinators. And in fact, a lot of the native pollinators may be at higher risk um, because of the fact that they don't live in separated hives that get moved around. They're living out in the environments themselves. So things like butterflies, um, monarchs, you know, um, some other pollinators have specifically been adapting along with the plants that they pollinate, so they're actually more effective than honeybees, things like bumblebees and their buzz pollination. And then you can also think about, you know, hummingbirds, hoverflies, beetles, all of these insects and animals are out there helping to pollinate our plants, increasing our seed and vegetable production. Most gardeners who are now become concerned about pollinators, their first step is to develop a pollinator garden. And I'm sure you guys have seen these. You probably have these at your extension offices. 
um, you know, lots of flowers, wide variety of flowers, different kinds of flowers, and then being aware of having those flowers flowering for a longer period of the year so that there is flowers, nectar and pollen out there for those early bumblebees, but then also pollen available later in the season when lots of things have died off. It's also important to consider creating habitat for those native pollinators, so having bare dirt or open earth areas for the ground dwelling bees, um, as well as leaving some things in place, such as canes from cane berries, so that the cane boring bees who use those for their habitat overwintering um, have some place to stay and settle. And you know, just waiting to clean up your cane canes until the spring can provide much needed habitat out in the environment. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll try and be loud. It sounds like you guys are still having a hard time hearing us, so I'll try and speak directly into the mic. Okay, so when do um, pesticides and pollinators, pollinators clash? So this is a situation when it gets to a point within your garden or your yard that you're dealing with pests um, and you need to take some action. Obviously, trying other methods first is ideal because the less you use, the less products you use, the less risk there's going to be to pollinators and other beneficials. If you're out, you have uh, you know, aphids taking over, then you go out and use a broad spectrum pesticide. You need to keep in mind that that is also going to affect the beneficial insects that may have shown up to help control that problem on their own. Um, so if you have aphids and ladybug larvae are there eating up those aphids and you go and spray them, you will also be killing off your beneficials. Um, so you just want to keep that in mind. It's not just about pollinators. There's also beneficial insects out there. So if you're using a product, you want to make sure you choose the appropriate product, read the label, make sure it's listed for the, the site that you want to apply to, like specifically list the vegetable or the plant, um, or something more broadly that encompasses that vegetable or plant, and then also the pest that you are trying to control because that means the manufacturers of the product have done some testing on that pest and shown that there is some level of efficacy. Okay, now when you are choosing a product, just like April had said, um, you want to keep in mind with the pollinators, the toxicity and the, the exposure. These two components are gonna develop in, or combine to create what level of risk the pollinators might be at. So when considering toxicity, you want to choose products that are low in toxicity to pollinators. So how do you do that? You want to check their active ingredient toxicity specifically to pollinators. Many products may have a pollinator protection statement on the label, so you'll want to read and look for that. Then if it doesn't have that on there and you want to dig a little deeper just to check, there are a few resources that I use frequently on the phone with callers that might be useful for you and might help you if you have these sorts of questions coming to your Master Gardener line or at um, you know, events that you guys are hosting. So the first is this publication out of OSU Extension called How to Reduce Bee Poisoning from Pesticides. Um, and it's available online. We're gonna send you these links in the follow-up email so you don't have to write this down. Um, you can download it as an app for your phone or for your tablet, it's free or you can just pull up the PDF online or download and print off the PDF. So this publication is great. It has a large section in the beginning that talks about lots of different tips for ways to reduce risk to bees, um, and then also specific sections written for beekeepers or you know, agricultural producers. Um, it also will list things like ways to minimize the risks, the signs and symptoms of bee poisoning, um, and then there's a large section with active ingredients listed out individually, and it shows the toxicity of each of those two bees. So here's an example. This is the very first part of that table. And as you can see, it says at the top that this is specific for bees that are typical in the California, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington area because they're on the West Coast. So if there's any master gardeners out there familiar with publications like this that are specific for other regions in the country, um, please email those to us. We would love to know about them so that we can add them to our repertoire as, as well. Um, but I think this is still a good baseline because a lot of this research is with the domesticated honeybee and they're you know, the same across the country and they're actually moved across the country. So um, you can see on the left here are the active ingredients from products. And in this publication, it has only insecticides listed. Um, oh, that's not true. I think they also list some fungicides 
but they don't really go into herbicides at all. Um, and then it shows here the different levels of toxicity. So if something is highly toxic to bees, that means it has an extended residual toxicity um, identified by the EPA, which means after the product has been applied, after eight hours or more, the residues from that application are still toxic enough to kill at least 25% of bees that will come visit that site or that plant. Um, if it has just a residual toxicity, which means it is toxic if the bees come right after the application, then that's also listed. It's just in the middle category. Um, and then if the product has no precautionary statements on the label, that is listed. The nice thing about this um, is that you can also see some additional research they've found for other kinds of bees. So there's leaf cutting bees, alkali bees listed here. They talk specifically about bumblebees. Um, so this is just a good place to go reference those different active ingredients. The other publication I use is out of U University of California IPM's program. And this is the Bee Precaution Pesticide Ratings. It's only online. I don't think it's available as an app. But the nice thing is that they do have herbicides listed on this. And so you pull this website up. We're also going to send that to you. And you just you know select your herbicide, hit the Add to List button, um, and then it pops up down below with the rating. And the rating comes with specific directions. So do not apply or allow to drift to plants that are flowering except when the application is made between sunset and midnight if allowed by the pesticide label and regulations, right? Because this product is toxic to honeybee brood. So you don't want a bee to come pick up this active ingredient and carry it back to their hive because it may be killing off their brood. And so, you know, applying it in the evening, then it has all night to dry before the morning when there's bees out foraging again. Okay, so now we've gone through a couple ways to look at the toxicity of those active ingredients. And now we're going to talk about how to reduce the exposure. And I'm sure that you guys have a lot of ideas on this, too. Um, these are just a few. This is not a comprehensive list, but it's a good place to start. So after you've chosen a product, you want to make sure that you follow all the label directions. You need to apply it according to the concentration on the label, apply it when it is supposed to be applied to the areas that are meant to be applied, and all of that. You want to make sure that you're avoiding spraying flowers directly because obviously pollinators will be coming to the flowers. And that includes weed flowers, right? Dandelions to us may seem like a weed. Many gardeners or general homeowners would say that. Um, maybe not as many master gardeners. But, you know, the dandelion is a great source for nectar and pollen for honeybees. And so my yard uh, might be full of dandelions <laughs> and the bees love it. Right? So you want to make sure you're not out there spraying the dandelions while they're in bloom. One thing you could do if you have a lawn like that with a lot of weeds is just mow the lawn before you do your application. Remove those flower heads so the pollinators aren't drawn in there before you're applying. Another thing you could do, like the previous publication recommended, is to spray in the evening. So going out after those bees are done foraging for the day, it's starting to get cool out, um, do that application, and then by the time the morning comes around, you know, there should be less residue for them and lower risk. Uh, obviously, if you're spraying things where bees overnight, so as you might be familiar, squash blossoms often will have bumblebees or other native bees sleeping in them overnight. So you'll want to check if it's a situation like that. Make sure there's not actually pollinators resting on those sites. Then you'll want to consider the possibility of using granules. So if you have a product that could be applied with granules, granules won't leave a residue on the leaves or on the flowers, so they are considered to be lower risk because of that. And also just be cautious of the available water. Pollinators obviously need water in their environment, so lots of people are starting to put water out um, in their gardens or their yards or may just have you know, water features in the yard anyway. Um, when you're doing an application, you want to make sure that that water is not in a situation where it might get sprayed during the application. And then also, if you have a large water feature, and you're doing some sort of mosquito treatment in it, you want to investigate to make sure that that mosquito treatment is not going to then cause death to any pollinators that come and drink out of that water source. Okay, so now I'm going to move a little bit and talk a little about neonicotinoids, um, because as you probably know, they come up in the news a lot related to pollinators. So what's up with neonicotinoids? Why are they such a big issue? Um, a little background. Neonics were originally registered as a possible replacement for organophosphates and older pesticides that have been used for a long time, but are very high in toxicity to people, and therefore are high risk for farm workers and people who are working out in the fields. 
Um, so neonics are actually much lower in toxicity to people, and so it's a way to have a product that's lower risk for those farm workers and their family. But then once we started using neonics more, um, we started becoming more and more aware of, of the risks to the pollinators. One thing that's unique about neonicotinoids is that they last for a very long time in the soil. It ranges depending on the neonic and the type of soil, but just as an example, um, imidacloprid has a half-life that can range from 40 to 997 days. So if you extrapolate that out, you know, to the point where the imidacloprid has broken down and is considered almost not there anymore, that can range from about a few months up to 13 years. So it really, it's a very long time. And while it's in the soil, neonicotinoids are absorbed up into the plants through their roots and then translocated into the leaves, into the pollen, and into the nectar. And that's where they've become an issue for pollinators because now the pollinators are coming and they're you know, getting that nectar, getting that pollen, bringing it back to their hive, and it has this insecticide in it and it's causing a lot of problems. Um, let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Oh, one thing I want to note is um, although you know, the neonics may not always have a lethal level, you know, if they drink them or are exposed to them directly, that's an insecticide, it can kill bees. Um, but they have found a lot of non-lethal effects as well. So these are things like reduced learning ability, navigational issues, and also like an anti-seeding effect to the bees. Um, and so just reducing their exposure as much as possible. Another thing to note is if you have pests uh, such as aphids or something that's eating on the sap of the plant or on the plant itself, and then beneficials come and eat those pests, uh, they have found some secondary toxicity risks to those beneficials. So if you have aphids and then a ladybug comes to eat it and the aphids are now full of neonics, then the, benef or the ladybug can also be damaged because of it. Okay, so what's happened? Well, the EPA created this new label back in 2013, I believe, um, and specifically for neonicotinoid products. So this label has a picture of a bee. It's supposed to be a visual cue to help people, you know, become aware when they're going to use the product that there's a higher risk to pollinate. So hopefully if you see this label on your product, then that's something to key into and follow those directions specifically because there's a higher risk for pollinators. A couple other things about neonics. Um, they are used a lot in treated seed. So like corn seed that's been treated with them so that when the corn starts growing, it just absorbs it straight from the ground, uh, which you would think you know, might be low risk for bees because bees don't pollinate corn. But when they're doing the planting of this, a lot of dust can be produced and that can be a problem for bees or other foragers in the area. And so there's been um, new technologies developed both in the treatment of the seed and also the application equipment to greatly reduce that dust that, that is produced. Uh, and so now I just want to say, you know, is there a reason that we're still using neonics and is there a place in your garden or your home where neonics would make sense? Well, there's a couple of situations you can think about if there are other risks. Um, I don't know if I have an example right now, but, you know, if you had a plant that didn't have flowers, it didn't flower, it's just a landscape plant, you are having really bad pest problems, that might be a situation where you could use those neonics. Um, or if you have like a house plant with a really bad infestation of something, mealy bugs come to mind because they're kind of hard to control, then treating the house plant with neonics is going to be pretty low risk because you're not going to have, you know, pollinators or beneficials coming into your house plant. Um, but you'll just want to be considerate of the fact that it's now in the soil, and then if that soil gets moved somewhere else, then it might be picked up by those other plants. Okay, so I'm going to move into safe use practices. I just want to make a note, um, because we started late with the webinar, you know, we're getting close to 11 o'clock here in Pacific time. So um, if you have to leave, we completely understand that. We're going to have Q&A, so we're going to stick around a little bit later um, after the end. And we're still recording all of this, so if you have to leave, don't worry. The recording will be posted um, on our YouTube channel within a week, probably. We're going to get right on it. So. Let me bust through the rest of these slides and then we'll get to the Q&A session, okay? Thank you guys for sticking around again. Okay, so safe use practices. So if you're using a product out in your yard, what do you have to consider? Or if you have you know, people coming and asking you questions as a master gardener, what are some tips you can give them, ways to empower them to reduce their risk? The first thing would be to read the label and the entire label. Um, here's an infographic we have that just points out 
some of the key parts of a label that you might want to pay attention to. It's using a mosquito repellent, but it goes for all pesticides, um, including herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. Um, so read through that label. You want to know where the directions are, how to use it, how it should be stored, you know, what are the first aid tips if something does go wrong. Become familiar with your, your products. Read them before you buy them, before you apply them, before you dispose of them, all those different types. The next thing would be to choose a low toxicity product. Now I talked about choosing low toxicity products for pollinators. Um, for people, it's a much quicker way to <laughs> identify if something has low toxicity. All pesticides have a signal word on the front of their label. So I'm gonna zoom into the corner here and you'll see a, you know, this is the label here. The signal words on um, pesticide labels are right on the front of the bottle. They say either caution, warning, or danger, all in capital letters. Um, caution is a lower toxicity product. Warning is moderately toxic, and danger is a high toxicity product. So when you're buying products, you can look at that just as a quick cue as to how toxic that product is. Um, and that's not talking about the active ingredient. It's talking about the formulated product. So if it's a concentrated product, that's the toxicity of the concentrated formulation. Once you dilute it, then that toxicity is obviously going to go down even further. Okay. So this is a quick way to do that. You can also look at your antimicrobial products, all pesticides have this on the very front label. Okay, the next thing would be to wear protective clothing. So when you're going out to spray, you don't want to dress like this guy. You don't want to go out with your short sleeves and your shorts on because there's a lot more skin available if something were to happen. If there was going to be an accidental spill or a gust of wind came, um, probably put your chickens up and away out of the way so that you don't have them running around while you're trying to do an application. You know, keep Keep things covered and, and close up. Um, you also probably don't have to dress like this, though, unless you're applying something really highly toxic and the label calls for it. But for most home use products, this is more of an appropriate outfit. So something long pants, long sleeve shirt, uh, some shoes, closed toed shoes, some sort of glove. It could be rubber gloves, latex gloves. Um, if you're applying a granular product or a dust product, sometimes those cotton gloves make more sense. So read the label and see if it says anything about the gloves on there. Um, this way you can take those clothes off at the end of the day and wash them in case any residues occurred and you don't have a chance of it being on your skin directly. I want, you want to mix smartly. And what I mean by smartly is if you have a concentrated product and you have to put it in something like a pump sprayer, do that mixing outside some, or someplace that's very well ventilated um, and also, you know, not in an area where there's a lot of wind or something, just be aware of that. And also be prepared during your mixing so that if an accident occurred and that concentrated product spills, you're ready to clean it up right away. So have gloves on hand, have some sort of absorbent material, kitty litter, um, sawdust, newspapers, anything like that, paper towels, and then a plastic bag so you can store all of that absorbed, you know, pesticide into something safe and dispose of it appropriately which would be through household hazardous waste. Okay, next you'll want to prepare the area. So if you're gonna be applying in your yard or in your garden, walk through the area ahead of the application and pick up anything out there, any dog toys, dog dishes, kid toys, kids, <laughs> you know, just get everything out of the area. Um, if there's furniture or lawn furniture, you can move that away from the application site, or cover it with a tarp. If there's large equipment, you can cover that with something or also, a sheet can be useful for covering it. It will absorb the, the liquids, and then you can wash that sheet to remove it. Um, so just walk through the area, make sure everything's picked up and put away, and then apply in good weather. So you don't want to be outside applying in a big gusty storm, so just be conscious of that. Um, if it's really hot out, sometimes things will evaporate quicker, and if it's really cold out, sometimes things will take longer to dry and will stick around. So just consider you know, what kind of temperature there is and how that might change the risks and the potential exposure. And then after the application, make sure that you wash up. So wash your application equipment, um, store it, put all the concentrated products away, put all the bottles away, you know, clean up afterwards, and then also wash yourself. Take a shower or wash your hands really well before you eat or drink, obviously, but also before you smoke or before you go to the bathroom, because that's actually a pretty high risk situation. So just to recap, here's all of those safe use practices. Um, these are all ways that you can minimize your exposure. And as we all know now, minimizing exposure is gonna reduce your risk. 
And we do these things to protect our family and our loved ones and our pets. Um, and you can also share these with people who are considering using products on their own. Um, we're running short on time, but I want to touch on going through and doing like some spring cleaning at the beginning of the garden season. So this is a picture from an estate sale, and it's just a good example of things that might be lying around in your shed or your garage. Um, and in this picture, you know, some products don't age well. Things can separate, chemicals can break down, some chemicals become more toxic as they're breaking down. There's one product in this picture um, that's very concerning to me. This was taken, I think, last year locally at an estate sale. And I don't know if you guys are familiar enough with pesticides to see something, if anything sticks out here, but right here in the corner, there's a product with diazinon in it. And diazinon is an organophosphate. Remember when I was saying neonics are replacing some of those organophosphates? Well, back in 2004, I think at the end of 2004, was the last time that um, organophosphate or diazinon products were allowed to be sold for use in residential areas. So for outdoor applications and residential products, that was the last time. So if this was taken you know, in 2017, and the last time that could have been purchased was 2004, then we're talking 13 years this has been sitting on the shelf. Um, and, and who knows if the state of that product is still going to be effective or if it's potentially more toxic. Um, so just going through annually and inventorying what you have is a good idea. Now, what do you do if you find something in there that you're not sure about or you want to dispose of? The first thing when you go, do, go through and do an inventory is just to be prepared. Again, having that absorbent material, a bag. As things are sitting, you know, bottles become brittle. Things might break. Um, you might be moving something and it drops and breaks. You just want to be prepared in case an accident occurs. And then if you do find things you want to dispose of, do that properly. So use some sort of a plastic tub or a box lined with some sort of plastic to store those materials in until you can properly dispose of it. And household products should be disposed of through the Household Hazardous Waste Program. And our My Local Resource database that April had mentioned earlier has some links to find your regional household hazardous waste. So we're going to share that in the email as well. Um, so store those products until you're able to dispose of them properly. And then if you have a product that you're not sure about, you don't know how old it is, you don't know, um, maybe you're missing a label, so you're not sure how to apply it even if you want to still use it. If you have specific product questions, you can call either us at NPIC or you can call the manufacturer and ask those questions. Um, it would be helpful if you had the EPA registration number for the product. This is kind of like a social security number for a product, so it helps us pull up that specific product. And we can look at you know, whether it's something that does break down and become more toxic or um, may lose its effectiveness, that sort of information. And then you can decide what to do with it. OK, so I think we are now at the end of all of our topics. Thank you so much for sticking with us um, past <laughs> the 11 o'clock hour. Um, just a quick recap about what we've talked about. We've kind of introduced you to NPIC. We've discussed risk and having risk communication questions, based questions rather than safety. We've gone through some organic pesticide information, ways to protect pollinators if you're using products in your yard or your garden, and then ways to use products safely overall. We're going to move into the questions section. I think Amy has been writing on questions as we've been going. Um, I just wanted to say too quickly, I'm really excited about having this webinar. We've been looking forward to this for a long time, and we've had registrations from over 41 states. So we have really great coverage across the country, which is really exciting. Um, if you guys as Master Gardeners are ever doing events and you want to share our information, um, you are welcome to call and pick that 800 number at the bottom and request brochures from us or other materials that we might be able to send out to you. Uh, we would be happy to do that. So just keep us in mind. We're a resource you can use and you can share. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the questions. And we have a lot of questions today, so um, what I want to emphasize is that if you haven't already, go ahead and jot down our phone number. Our hotline today is open for another hour, and then, of course, we're open Monday through Friday, 8 to noon Pacific time, which is 11 to 3 Eastern time. So if we don't get a chance to answer your specific question today, go ahead and call our hotline. Talk to one of our specialists, and they'll have a more full conversation with you about that question. Uh, one of the first questions we received today was about our pesticide fact sheets. If we're not medically trained, how can we comment on, for example, carcinogens or other health risks? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we're also not medically trained, but we are scientists. And if 
you ever get questions like that, like a health question that you don't feel comfortable answering, you can always refer them to us. So we are trained in discussing health risks with people, um, and there are a lot of resources we use to look up you know, that kind of information. On our fact sheets, as she mentioned, there is some information about cancer and carcinogenicity, um, but cancer is a difficult topic to talk with people about. So I would recommend that you send them to us if you're unsure. And if you have questions on your own, please definitely call us. And just to clarify, all of our fact sheets um, are written with scientific, from scientific sources. Mm -hmm. So we're not making up or creating assessments of anything ourselves. This is all assessments done by regulatory agencies or other highly reputable agencies. Um, so another question we received is, do organic pesticides vary in the level of toxicity, including high toxicity, which would then impact the level of exposure um, to have it remain, quote unquote, safe? Great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. So there's definitely um, some variability in the level of toxicity, and there might be a, a information on that label that could help you see what the level of toxicity is. So maybe looking for those signal words like Alicia discussed, looking for that word caution, warning, or danger can help you see what that level of toxicity is really quickly just by picking up that label and checking it out. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question about the picture of the caterpillar next to the aphids. Alicia, do you remember if that was a pest or beneficial? The caterpillar? Yeah, the caterpillar. Caterpillars are tricky, right, because they turn into beneficials once they're flying around and pollinating, but often as caterpillars, they're still eating our plants. So I don't remember what kind of caterpillar that was. Um, I'm not sure, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so another question. Rotenone was banned a few years ago after decades of use as an organic pesticide. Are there other organic pesticides currently approved but under scrutiny? Good question, and that's something that may be going on. The USDA might be a good resource to ask about whether there's particular ones that are undergoing additional scrutiny right now. Um, the Organic Materials Review Institute, OMRI, might have additional information, but the USDA is the regulator of the National Organic Program, and they might, they're the ones that are setting the rules for what types of ingredients can and cannot be used in organic production. Another question about our fact sheets. Do your written fact sheets incorporate research-based information contained in the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, and Centers for Disease Control? Yeah, our, our fact sheets have resources attached to them. You can see, find those at the bottom of those fact sheets. The fact sheets aim to follow what the body of evidence shows. So we're pulling from lots of different agencies, including the CDC, the EPA, other bodies of, of evidence, uh, other bodies of research that are out there as well. Yeah, we're all scientists here. We all have been trained in being, you know, really particular about where our data comes from. Um, and there's a lot of internal review within our office between different people when fact sheets are being written and then some external review as well. So we definitely try to get those as accurate as possible. Is an EIQ rating applicable to humans and or the target pest, and is there a complete list of EIQ pesticides available? I think April might be able to address this one somewhat. Yeah, I have a little bit of information about that. Um, my understanding is that EIQ incorporates lots of different factors, like the toxicity, if you were to get that on the skin, the toxicity if you were to in inhale it. Also, it incorporates things like toxicity to fish. So. It might, what's it stand for? Um, in, let's see. I think it's environmental impact quotient. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and those different factors might not be exactly what you are concerned about in a situation. So if something may, is really high in toxicity to fish, I'm not sure, but maybe that would change that EIQ rating to be like artificially high. Mm. This is something that I'm not an expert on, I should say. Um, and so there may be some applications of, of this, um, but in terms of exactly what it, what it can be used for, um, maybe we can look into that a little bit more and we can discuss a little bit further if um, you'd like to call us. Yeah, calling is a good option here. Um, let's see. So you cite emphasis on quote unquote risk rather than safety. Is not risk proportional to safety? Sure, it it can be related, and it, it certainly is related. Um, sometimes, 
just using the word safe, though, can have these implications attached to it that don't allow us to see the whole picture. And using risk helps us see the broader picture in any single situation. And yeah, it's a, yeah. go ahead, Alicia. I was just going to say, I can see how uh, the term safe itself is like a yes or no sort of thing. The term safety maybe incorporates more flexibility there, like risk except for I would be concerned that somebody would hear safety and, and walk away thinking safe. You know, so I think we, we kind of try and just separate away from that term altogether and move towards risk so that we can have those longer conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I believe this question is about the neonicotinoid section. Are other systemics not bringing ingredients into the nectar? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, so pesticides that get absorbed into plants and get moved through the plants, some are very specific where they get moved to. So some translocate specifically to the roots. Um, some only translocate to marry stems, you know, where the plant is developing actively. Um, so those things are less likely to be moving into the nectar or the pollen. Uh, so it really depends on a an active ingredient by active ingredient situation. Uh, but that's the sort of thing, if you had a question about, we'd be happy to look up your specific active ingredient and look at where the research shows it is moving within plants. Another question, don't neonics break down over time? In other words, at 100 days in the soil, isn't the potency lower? Yes, definitely. So half-life, I kind of threw that in there, and it's kind of a complicated um, thing to consider if you're not familiar with the term half-life. but all chemicals break down at some rate. Some things break down very, very slowly, and if that's the case, they'll have a very high half-life. If they break down quickly, then they have a very low half-life, right? Some things break down within a matter of hours. Um, so with the imidacloprid example, I said the half-life was 40 to 997 days. So the half-life is how long it takes for half of the chemical to break down. So definitely after 40 days or 900, wherever it falls on that spectrum, you know, half of it is gone, and that is a lower risk because there's less available. Um, when I extrapolated it to, you know, breaking it down almost completely, we say after five half-lifes, that brings you down to about 3%. So half-life, if you picture like a pie, the first half-life, you cut that pie in half and you eat half of it. The second half-life, you cut the remaining half in half, and then you eat that half, and now you've just got a quarter of the pie. That's after two half-lifes. Then you're going to cut that in half again, and take half of it away, that's three half-lives, and you continue like that until it's almost gone. So five half-lives gets you down to 3% of the originally applied product. So definitely over time it's decreasing and there is lower risk. Are there any studies on neonic uh, toxicity in people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, definitely. They are required to do uh, toxicity studies with people or uh, on animals and then extrapolate that to people. Um, there are most of the data that we have access to relating to people specifically have to do with either accidental or intentional ingestion, um, you know, poisoning situations or situations where people spill it on their skin or situations like that. So there is data that we can access on each, you know, neonicotinoid and see what's available. It kind of just ranges. Um, we don't, in science, often poison people to test on how it goes. I mean, that's, there's a lot of restrictions there, so. Okay. Uh, is it not important, considering the risk or safety of pesticides, to be aware not only of the acute risks or safety, but also to the chronic or long-term risks or safety associated with the pesticides? And, and particularly, what about research-based information? Absolutely. Again, there are requirements for testing on chronic, on chronic levels of toxicity toxicity, subchronic levels of toxicity. I think today we were focusing more on that acute, framing things with that acute toxicity in mind, but our fact sheets do have a section about the long-term risks and what are the long-term symptom effects um, of different pesticides, so you might consider checking those out to see some of the research that has been done. There's a lot of research out there about that type of work, about that type of question. So this... Um Person writes, I have awful Japanese beetles. I saw that seven will kill them, but I want to be careful of the bees. What ingredient should we use or avoid that is still effective on the beetles, but that's safe for our pollinators? Mm. Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Because, uh, you know, insecticides 
there's I'm not familiar with a product that's been designed that only affects Japanese beetles. That's technology that they're working on right now to try and develop pesticides that are specific to a species of insects and will not harm other species. So there is research going into developing that, um, the RNAI research. But right now, most of the pesticides I can think of would affect uh, both. There are pesticides that are specific to groups of species, so things that would affect beetles um, but not affect bees, something that would have to be something they ingest, so like BT or something like that may be Yeah, there's, there's also risk. ingredients that are intended to be applied during certain life stages. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, there's an active ingredient called chlorantranilaprol that is a granular product that gets applied to lawns and is, is targeting the grub stage while the Japanese beetles have not yet emerged. Um, and so that theoretically is, is not just um, specific to beetles, but it's also targeting a life stage that, that bees wouldn't be interacting with. So there may be options that the toxicity isn't specific, but the contact or the exposure yeah. is specific to beetles. Yeah, good point. Okay, so we have, we have a lot more questions. We're going to try to get through maybe three more. And then um, the remainder of the questions, again, I'll encourage you to go ahead and write down your own question, write down our phone number, call us on our hotline um, today or tomorrow or anytime that's convenient for you to, to get your questions answered. But we'll pick maybe three more to respond to. Um, what is the effect of fungicides on native bees? Yeah, good question. There's a lot of research showing that fungicides can affect um, development of honeybees, bruise, it can stick around in the wax of the honeybees. Now, native bees may have a different potential exposure because of that. Um, I would have to look it up. You, you should call NPIC and we can look up and see what research has been done specifically on native bees with fungicides. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Okay, so this next question is, um, I think, widely applicable. Gardeners are worried about buying ornamental plants that have been treated with neonics. Is this a real concern, and how do we address it with them? That's a great question. Um, as you're probably familiar, a lot of big box stores have been starting to uh, deem their, you know, make sure that they're selling plants that will have a label that say something like bee friendly or pollinator friendly, and that's because they haven't been treated with neonicotinoids. Um, but that doesn't mean they haven't been treated with other pesticides. So just be aware of the fact that they may still have products on them, but it's probably not something that's going to be sticky around in the soil. Um, if they are buying plants that are going to be used indoors, you can talk about the differences and risks there. If they're buying plants that are going to be put outside, there are some things they can do to reduce the potential exposure to pollinators. So if the soil was treated in this potted plant they're buying, they can wash that soil off before they plant it you know, bag it up and throw it away. And that would remove a lot of that pesticide and reduce the amount that could be absorbed up into the plants. Um, so anything they can think of to re reduce the amount that is there are some options. Um, you can also, you know, feel free to send them to us because if they're buying small potted plants, the amount of neonics in there, by that time that plant is huge and flowering, might be very small and the risks might be very low. Okay, so um, if you launder pesticide-coated clothing, will pesticides run into the sewer system, and does this water treatment system remove pesticides? And a very, a very similar question I'm going to add on to that. Does mm -hmm. clothing sprayed with pesticide affect pollinators? These are both clothing questions. Yeah, good question. question. Yeah. Do you want to do that? Sure, sure. I'll start. So, um, washing clo clothing that's washed and water that runs into a water treatment facility is treated, um, and there are certain levels that need, need to be um, reached for certain pesticides. So, there ha those levels have to be low in water. Um, you could contact your local water treatment facility, and they might have additional information on the types of pesticides that they are testing for, and they might be able to provide you with that data. It depends on the area, I believe. Yeah, I think generally if you are out doing an application and you get some pesticides on your clothes, um, you can think about the amount that's going into the water and the amount of water that's coming from other places, and it's going to be quite diluted. Uh, but there are definitely things that break it down. You know, some things break down in water naturally and some things don't. Um, if you are out doing an application, I didn't really mention this, but if you get a lot of pesticides on your clothes, you'll want to wash those separate from the rest of your clothes. 
So do a laundry load by itself in as hot of water as possible with a strong detergent. Um, and if possible, hang those clothes up outside to dry because sun will help break down those chemicals much faster than putting them in the dryer would. Um, and then the second part of the question was about treating your clothes. So if, like, if you use permethrin or something on your clothes, like a permethrin spray that's meant to treat fabrics to control ticks or mosquitoes, um, those bind really tightly to those clothes particles. They're not likely to be moving off of your clothes into other areas. And the risks would be, you know, if you're going to, say, a butterfly garden, you probably don't want to wear your permethrin treating clothes, but otherwise the risks would be really low. Basically, if they're landing on you directly, that's yeah. where their highest risk would come from. Right. They have to contact you. It's not something where it's off-gassing into the environment. Um, they need to land on you directly. Okay, unfortunately, we just have so many questions today, and we're really grateful for all of those questions. Um, please call us at 800-858-7378 if we didn't get a chance to talk about your question. But uh, unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time today, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank and I'm going to so say, much. too, we're going to put together um, follow-up emails. So if there's any of these questions that are things we could answer in email, we'll try and include those in a follow-up, okay? Thank you guys all for coming.